Let's consider the situation where a rock is thrown up into the air, or a baseball, pop ball, or whatever results in an object going straight up and, due to gravity, slowing down till it comes to a point where the velocity is zero, right at the very top, and then the velocity becomes increasingly negative as it falls back to the level of your hand. During this whole trip, the velocity is continually changing, but the acceleration is always the same. That is, 9.8 meters per second squared toward the ground. Note that we spread it out horizontally here to make it easier to see, but consider it as simply an object going straight up and then back down to the hand level. In a case like this, there are definitely some patterns that we should recognize. For example, let's say you toss a rock straight up into the air and it spends three seconds in the air before returning to your hand. What was its initial velocity? Let's look at three methods to consider this problem. It's good to understand all three of these methods, as each one exposes ideas that are useful for solving more complicated problems. Method 1. If we consider the whole trip from your hand, upwards to the top and back to your hand, it would involve the entire three seconds. So, t equals 3. Now what about the displacement for this situation? What do you think? Well, right, the displacement would be zero. It goes up to the top and back down, but in the end, the rock is right back where it started, in your hand. And we could put that into this equation, and with d equals zero, it simplifies it quite a bit. So whether we're solving for time, or in this case solving for initial velocity, we can rearrange and solve the problem quite nicely. Method 2. In this case, we'll consider only half the trip. Our situation begins when he releases the rock just like before, but it finishes at the top of the rock's journey. In this case, the displacement isn't zero. The displacement represents the highest point that the rock travels. So this makes this method good for situations where we're asked, how high can a ball be thrown, or how high does a rock go if, or things like that. In this case, the strategy is to make the equation simpler, and it involves our final velocity. The velocity passes zero right at the very top here. So for this situation, we could use an equation with vf in it, like these. And with vf is zero, these terms are gone, and that simplifies the equations nicely. One thing to remember for this method is that the time would be, well, what do you think? If the total journey took three seconds, then this half journey, just to the top, would be 1.5 seconds. So don't forget to half your time when you're using this method. Method 3. For this method, we simply recognize the symmetry of this rock's trip. We recognize that if we don't consider friction, which is quite common for a case of a rock thrown up, we know that the rate of change of velocity is the same going up as it is coming down. That is, 9.8 meters per second squared towards the Earth. So, if the rock is thrown up at 5 meters per second, let's say, then it might be 4 meters per second here, and maybe 2 meters per second here, and then 0, of course, at the top here. Now, with the same acceleration, we'd be seeing negative 2 meters per second here, then negative 4 meters per second here, and back to negative 5 meters per second here, at the hand level. Note the symmetry? So let's take away these sample numbers, but we're left to conclude that, whatever the velocities, the symmetry would dictate that Vf is just the same as negative V0. If V0 is 10 meters per second up, then Vf is 10 meters per second down, or negative 10 meters per second. 
And this allows us to take the equations that use both V0 and Vf and simply replace Vf with a negative V0. And that simplifies things down a bit. So, again, all of these methods are very useful and important to understand. If you understand them all, then you're well prepared for a wide variety of problems.